Turn your Bibles with me, please, to Galatians chapter 3. We continue our series on biblical hermeneutics, our biblical interpretation, how to interpret the Bible. A little booklet which we circulate from Christian Research Institute, which I highly recommend, it's called The Disease of the Health and Wealth Gospel. The Disease of the Health and Wealth Gospel by Dr. Gordon Fee, Professor of Interpretation and Theology at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He's a Pentecostal, very fine scholar, and a friend. Gordon has done a great service to the church by putting in simple language as a professor of interpretation, the errors of the health and wealth evangelists. He's speaking here about Kenneth Copeland particularly, and I quote him. At such points, Copeland's interpretation is said to come from the Holy Spirit. But there is a basic misunderstanding. What Copeland does to the story of the rich young ruler suggesting that Jesus is affirming his wealth as a result of his lifelong obedience and was only testing him to give it away so that he might regain all the more is so plainly contrary to the intent of the text that he would do well to be careful about attributing to the Holy Spirit this bit of subjectivity. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit who inspired the original text with its plain meaning is now to be found contradicting himself. Listen to this quote. Copeland's and his friend's hermeneutics, therefore, or system of interpretation, is not in fact attempting to give us only what the Bible actually says. It is almost totally subjective and comes not from study, but from meditation, which in Copeland's case means a kind of free association based on a prior commitment to his wholly, totally wrong understanding of basic texts. This professor of hermeneutics, I am too, I quote him so you just won't have to take my word for it, in which Dr. Fee points something out that's very important. It's one thing to have the text of Scripture. It's another thing to have the tools to interpret it. Everybody can understand the plain meaning of a text, and you don't need to be a scholar to do that. But when you start teaching people biblical theology from the text of Scripture, you had better know the rules you had better know what you can and can't do. And you had better not base it on your subjective feeling and meditation of what you think the Holy Spirit said. You better go find out what the Holy Spirit did say. And then you can rearrange your subjective impressions accordingly. But it's what the Holy Spirit says that's important. The statement, Copeland and his friend's hermeneutics, therefore, is not in fact attempting to give us only what the Bible says. It is almost totally subjective, which means it's what Kenneth Copeland, Frederick Price, Earl Polk, Kenneth Hagin, and the faith teachers feel the text says. What the Holy Spirit has told them it says. What their meditations say to them that it is. But that is not the way you interpret the Bible. Jesus said not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until all has reached its consummation. He said whoever will teach men disobedience to God's word shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So it's very important for me as a teacher not to teach you or anybody else any form of disobedience or unbelief in the Word of God. I've got to teach you what it says, even though I may not like sometimes what it says, even though it may go against my subjective feeling of what I feel the Holy Spirit has told me. That has nothing to do with what this text says. And that's the point that Dr. Fee is making. And I'm beginning by pointing that out. It isn't what you feel about a text that makes it true or gives you what the text says any more than how you feel about your salvation either gives it to you or takes it away from you. Your salvation does not depend on your subjective feeling about your relationship to Christ. Your salvation depends upon 
what Christ did for you on a cross outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and when he rose from the dead, what it means to you. Now, there are days when I don't feel particularly well saved. I'm unhappy with some of the things I've thought or done, and I have to go before the Lord and say, uh, please strengthen me and cleanse me and, uh, and keep me from uh, the propensity of all human flesh, which is to make asininity a career. <laughs> We've all been there. So, please, God, help me not to take myself too seriously. Please, Lord, forgive me this, forgive me that. We've all been there, right? We have to come to the Lord. We have to ask Him this. Why? Well, I may not feel particularly warm or close to the Lord that day, but my relationship to Christ has not changed. I can remember when my father and I had disagreements. My father was a small man, five feet seven, but he had a voice that sounded like thunder. When my father said, jump, everybody in the house said, how high? <laughs> Nobody argued with him. He was the judge, and he was literally a judge. I remember when I argued with my father. It was a rather fruitless attempt most of the time, but I argued with my father. And I got mad at him. And he was still my father. No matter how angry I got, and no matter how mad he got at me, I was always his son. The relationship never changed. Your relationship to Jesus Christ doesn't change by how you feel. Your relationship to Christ rests upon what Jesus did for you. That's the most important thing to get fixed in your head. Billy Graham once said to me, there are days when I feel saved, there are days when I feel lost. Thank God my salvation doesn't depend on either one of those days. It depends on what Jesus did. That's the core of the whole thing. This is the world's greatest evangelist. So we all have the problem because we all have the nature of Adam. So when you're dealing with feelings and subjectivity, the worst thing you can do is transpose that into the interpretation of the Bible. Because when you do, you don't end up with what the text says. You end up with what you feel the text says. Uh-uh. Be careful. The text is what makes the difference, not how you feel. Now with these little words of warning on the wrong kind of hermeneutic, which is subjective hermeneutic. I want to show you just exactly how they manage to confuse so many people. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. No man is justified by the law on the sight of God. It is evident. For the just by faith, says the Greek, the just, by faith, will live. The law is not of faith. But the man that does the law lives in it, or lives by it. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. As it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, this is very important, because... The Scripture has also told us, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, and the rest of the faith teachers all take Deuteronomy 27, connect it to Galatians chapter 3, and tell you that you were cursed under the law, but Jesus, when he died on the cross, took all those curses away from you. So the curse of ill health is gone. And all the curses listed in Deuteronomy chapter 27. This is what is called collapsing contexts. Collapsing contexts. We gave another illustration of it before. You collapse the context of Deuteronomy 27 and Galatians 3 and bring them both together. When in fact they are not speaking about the same thing at all. The fact that the word curse appears and the word law appears does not mean that it's talking about the same subject. The great New Testament scholar, Dean Alford, a very brilliant Greek exegete, made a notation in his commentary, which I read last night again. Alford, who spoke Greek, <laughs> that's how good he was at it, Alford said, we must never forget the law was never given to the Gentiles. Keep that in your head. That, that's very important. The law was never given to the Gentiles. The law was given to Israel. Not to the Galatians. Not to the Ephesians. Not to the Thessalonians. 
Paul is only using, says Alford, the law as an example. He is not trying to force them into the context of the law because the law wasn't given to them. Grace was given to them. And faith, which delivered them from everything that the Jews couldn't keep. So the whole thrust of Galatians chapter 3 is that Christ has redeemed us from what? What did he redeem us from? From the curse of the law. Why was it a curse? Because they couldn't keep it. Notice it's a singular, the curse of the law, not the curses of the law. Deuteronomy 27 lists a whole bunch of curses. But Paul says, I'm not talking about the curses of the law. I'm talking about the law itself is a curse because you can't keep it. The Jews couldn't keep it. You guys can't keep it. Christ redeemed us from it. Why are you going back again to build as Gentile Christians on the foundation of the law which the Jews couldn't keep? That's the whole argument. What purpose then serves the law? It was our school teacher to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by what? Faith. And the law is not of faith. Copeland and the rest are saying, you're free from all the curses of the law because Jesus died for you. I got some news for you. You never had those curses. Because the law wasn't given to you. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 27, he tells them all these curses and all these blessings to who? Israel, the Jews, if you do this. But, but they were the only ones that had it. The Chinese didn't have it. The Aborigines didn't have it. The Chaldeans didn't have it. The Egyptians didn't have it. Who had it? The Jew. So he uses a Jewish illustration in a Gentile context to tell Christians not to try and be Jews. This won't work. It worked for the Jews, won't work for you. But by collapsing the context together and bringing Deuteronomy 27 together with Galatians chapter 3, with pure subjectivism, the faith teachers say, all these curses are gone. Hardly, since they were never there. Not for the Gentiles. We are not under law. We're under grace. And they keep dragging you back under the law to tell you that you can get prosperous and wealthy. And get all the things that the Jews got. All you have to do, collapse the context and put it together. Now, it's very important that Dr. Fee, who is, as I said, a professor of hermeneutics, recognizes what they're doing. And he says, the selectivity of these evangelists allows them not only to espouse a view not taught anywhere in the New Testament. That's very significant. They hold the view not taught anywhere in the New Testament, but also carefully enables them to avoid hundreds of texts that stand squarely opposite to their teachings. This hermeneutical selectivity is most noticeable in their understanding of poverty and prosperity, which they themselves see as conflicting realities. In other words, if you're a Christian, you should be rich. If you're a Christian, you should be prosperous. If you're a Christian, you should have all these things. They exclude Christians who are poor. They exclude Christians who don't have the abilities of other Christians. As the man sitting in this room, I won't mention him by name. But his ability to make money. He makes lots of money. That's his business. He doesn't make money for the sake of money. He makes money so that he can program it into the work of God. That's the right motive. But he makes money. The fact that he makes money doesn't demonstrate at all that he's a great man of faith. <laughs> he has the ability to make money. The fact that he makes money doesn't make him better than people sitting in this room who don't have any, or very little. It doesn't increase his spirituality one inch. 
that he's prosperous. As Joe Magliotto wrote in a little book a few years ago, you shall know them by their Cadillacs. <laughs> the fact that a guy drives a Mercedes or a Maserati or a Cadillac or something else doesn't mean he's more spiritual than a guy that drives a Taurus, like I do. <laughs> Actually, it's my wife's car. I drive a 1978 Cadillac. I can afford something better, but I like my 1978 Cadillac. Why? Because when I'm out on the freeway, all those little Japanese sardine cans run away from me. <laughs> I have a deep sense of personal security when I'm on the freeway. The only thing that bothers me are trailer trucks. And I stay in another lane from them. The point is, having wealth, position, power, and status doesn't mean that you're spiritual. And, as Dr. Fee says better than I could, quote, one may count on it. Any gospel that will not sell as well among believers in Upper Volta, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, or Orange County, California, or Tulsa County, Oklahoma, is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So because these people have nothing, doesn't mean that they are less Christians than an affluent Orange County businessman who makes money. See, the whole point is that God gives you what you need, and he blesses people. But that doesn't mean because a person doesn't get a lot that God loves them less. And that's the damnable thing that's been pervaded by this gospel that they're preaching. If you're a Christian, you should have it made. If you're a Christian, all possibilities are yours. If you're a Christian, you should have money. You should have no financial problems. You should have health. You should have wealth. You should have all these things because you're a king's kid. Read my lips. <laughs> what about the 11th chapter of Hebrews? They were sawn asunder. They hid in caves, flogged, tortured, beaten, murdered, torn apart by animals, sawn in two with swords, and all these, not having received the promise of redemption, waited until ours came together, and all of these inherit the kingdom just as any wealthy, affluent, successful, or status-conscious Christian. The whole idea of Hebrews 11 is, hey, the unknown soldiers of faith are known to God. You're one of them? Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul contradicts the faith teachers and expands their context instead of collapsing it. He says, and I want you to look at this, in Philippians chapter 4, the answer to all of their arguments is right here. Which at the time of Gwyneth, I don't. Verse 11. This is the greatest of the apostles, man who went to the third heaven. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Whatever state I am in, therewith to think with great possibility and positiveness. so that I may attain more wealth and position and power and status and thus prove that I am the apostle that went to the third heaven. Ah. Whatever state I am in there with to be content, I know how to be abased, made low, says the Greek, and how to abound. Everywhere and in everything, I'm instructed. I Get that? Not an option. I am instructed to be full and hungry. Whoopee! You know, when I was a starving student, I was at one time in my life, I used to save up for Friday night to go to Horn and Hard Arts Automat in New York. I think I, it cost a dollar twenty-nine to have dinner then. And I always went on Friday night because they had scallops. And I liked scallops. And I can see that big bin of scallops sitting there. For my dollar twenty nine, I got soup, clam chowder, bowl of it, crackers, all I could eat. I ate plenty of them. And then this plate full of scallops. And I think the guy knew me because when he saw me come in, he'd always put a few extras on. I needed them. And scallops and potatoes and everything. And then applesauce and finally a little dessert and some coffee. $1.29. 
Boy, I lived for Friday nights. But there were times during the week when I didn't have anything. There were times during the week when I was hungry. There were times during the week when I was empty. There were times during the week when I had to ask the Lord to give me the grace and the strength so I could go on. And he did. And I learned what Paul said is true. I know how to be humbled, and I know how to be multiplied. Everywhere and in all things, I have been instructed by God to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. That's what the faith teachers do not understand. Suffer need. They fly in their jets. They drive their Mercedes. They stand in front of their large audiences and rake in all the big money. And they pour scorn on the people that don't have what they have. As if you were a second-class citizen because you don't have the things they possess. The Apostle Paul rebukes them. I know how to be full. I know how to be hungry. I know how to abound. And I know how to suffer. They don't know how to suffer. They're too busy stringing their guitars and cashing their royalty checks. They're too busy blustering to everybody about name it and claim it, which is blab it and grab it. They're too busy trying to make the grace of God work for them. But I, says Paul, know how to. Get, you ought to underline that word in your Bible. That's a very good word there. Suffer! I know what it is to suffer for Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. You know, how, you know how Paul knew? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Yeah, no other text in Scripture. That would be the end of it. For all this false gospel of health and wealth. Now let me add one other note and we'll be finished. You see how a false interpretation and a collapsing of context, bringing two things together, makes it appear as if wealth is yours because the curse of poverty has been removed. Do you see that? Poverty is not necessarily a curse. That's what they miss. There are people right now who are poor and they are richer than Hagen and Copeland ever dreamed of being. There are people who are poor in Upper Volta, Bangladesh, and everywhere else who love Jesus Christ. They haven't got a penny, but they're alive. And they know how to be full, they know how to be hungry, and they know in whatever state they're in to be content, and they're trusting Christ. You see, in the faith teacher's gospel, poverty can never be the will of God. But in the economy of divine revelation, God may make you poor so that your thick head may get the message. God may take from you something that you want and your stability so you may learn to rely on Him. Because wealth and the things that go with prosperity can become insulations against the love of God, the grace of God and the worship of God, so that men forget the source of the gift in their great desire to covet it. It is not spiritually demeaning to be poor. It is spiritually demeaning not to glorify God in the midst of poverty or wealth because it is God who is working all things together for good to them that love him and to them who are called according to his purpose. The dangers of the health wealth gospel is that it makes God a divine bellboy. And every time you want something, you just ring the bell, and God's going to run over there and get it for you because you have faith. As I said to Dr. Schuler when we talked about this one subject, everything may be possible to him that believes, but not everything is expedient. It isn't always God's will to give you whatever you want. It may destroy you. That's the reason why you don't have it. If we can learn anything from this 
message this morning. Let us learn that the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the riches of all creation were his inheritance, emptied himself, took upon himself the form of a slave, and lived as a carpenter. He who owned everything was willingly disinherited that we might inherit everything. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Is God against riches for Christians? No. Is God against you succeeding in business? No. Is God against people who are rich? No. He tells you if you are rich and you have been blessed, then be generous and willing, 1 Timothy 6, 17, to share with those that don't have it. And then he tells you something else. Quote, People like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, and the faith teachers who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. 1 Timothy 6. It is a trap to desire, to covet, to be greedy, even in the name of God, for your own needs. The kingdom of God is not in meat or drink, but in righteousness and joy and in peace in the Holy Spirit. And this is the divine dictum. Remember it well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He spoke in the context of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the shelter over your head, and the next day. Take no thought for it, for sufficient unto that day is the evil in it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and whatever your needs are, they'll be added unto you. Because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Shall we pray? Our Father, every person in this room this morning who knows you knows that we were once terribly impoverished, lost, undone, ignoble, and nothing. And it pleased you in the fullness of time to send him into the world that through his poverty, who had everything, we might inherit the riches of eternity. Oh God, our Father, if there's any person here this morning who doesn't know Jesus Christ, the ultimate wealth of heaven, who has never been reborn and never known the peace of God, give them neither rest nor peace until they shall make peace with you. But, Lord, upon those who love you this morning, open thy scriptures through thy spirit to our hearts and lives and shed upon us the bright light of thy illumination. Teach us of thyself. Help us to draw near to thee. Cleanse us of our sins. Fill us afresh with thy Holy Spirit. And give us a joy in thy salvation, in the knowledge of that you will provide all our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, with praise and thanksgiving, we ask it. Amen.